So welcome everyone to the Data Blitz session of um, the Spark annual meeting. Um, this is something that we've hosted now, we think for about four or five years in this format. Um, it continuously evolves um, and uh, we always uh, really enjoy uh, hosting it, both uh, Tim and I. Um, so one of the, the sort of criteria are that um, individuals who have been asked to present a poster are given uh, one slide each and a certain set amount of time for which they need to sort of tease you, entice you to go and view their poster. Now, this works extremely well in person, and it's a bit, bit of energy and fun sort of people on and off the stage. Um, so doing this virtually, hopefully, will have that same energy and an excitement. So this year, there's 90 seconds per individual uh, presenting their, their poster slide. Um, and after the session, um, make sure you, you, you go into um, the, the individual's session so you can choose which poster you'd like to go into and have a chat or listen um, as, as each of the presenters tells you a little bit more about their research. So first up, um, and this is again 90 seconds, um, so the slide will probably advance. I'm also keeping track of time as well, so it'll be a bit hard here. So the first is Leslie Green, and she'll be talking about fibromyalgia and ass assessment of exposure to traumatic life events. At Stop Hill Hospital in North Glasgow, we analysed 100 sequential fibromyalgia patients presenting to the pain clinic in a calendar year. Patients were consulted by one of two practitioners, either consultant anaesthetist or clinical nurse specialist, experienced in assessing fibromyalgia. We undertook a standard consultation, including traumatic events history. We had previously already embedded this in our practice, but wanted to quantify how relevant this aspect of consultation was to our patient population. Trauma was categorised as shown. On average, patients had been exposed to a median of two categories of traumatic events, with approximately one third of the total cohort being exposed to three or more categories. In total, 89% had experienced adverse childhood or adulthood experiences of which 45% had significant ongoing mood issues wholly or partly related to previous adverse events. Higher PHQ-9 depression scores were significantly associated with trauma histories. We referred 50% onwards to appropriate psychological services depending on patient narrative with a trend to higher referral in those with traumatic event histories. These findings have reinforced our current practice and we recommend exploring traumatic event histories and psychological sequelae at first contact to better direct further intervention. Excellent. Great. And uh, so our next speaker will be uh, Cass McGregor, and she's going to present a multidisciplinary pathway in primary care for people with fibromyalgia, a test of change project. So please go ahead, Cass. Thank you. So with the MPPP funding, um, we set up a small test of change project in a GP practice for people with fibromyalgia. After telephone screening, people were invited to a one hour joint assessment using GP and physiotherapist time. This was myself and Chris Lockwell. So this was for assessment, focusing on psychosocial assessment, with a conversation about management options. We also supported the project with regular interdisciplinary team meetings, including someone with lived experience, and also supported the pathway with psychology-facilitated interdisciplinary supervision. We gathered qualitative data because we wanted to understand how people had experienced the pathway from service users and from staff. So some of the themes are shown in the slide just now with further examples in the poster. Is that you done? Uh, yep. Yes, okay, well, well done. You had time to spare. Let's see. Excellent. So now Katrazina Mazur will present characterization of touch and pain, behavioral phenotype, and an FMR1 rat model of Fragile X syndrome. Thank you. Fragile X syndrome is the most common cause of monogenic inherited intellectual disability and autism spectrum disorder. 
All that sensitivity to sensory stimuli, including tactile hypersensitivity, is frequently reported in individuals with fragile X. The disorder is caused by a mutation in the fMR1 gene, and fMR1 knockout mice have been observed to have altered sensitivity to touch. We aim to assess the tactile and nociceptive phenotype in a novel fMR1 knockout rat model using a set of behavioral assays, as this model provides an alternative tool to study the mechanisms underlying altered touch and pain sensitivity in autism spectrum disorders. In the study, the fMR1 knockout rats did not significantly differ from wild types in their tactile sensitivity of glabrous skin, as shown by the paintbrush assay, as well as hairy skin, as measured by the tape response assay. We also found no significant difference in their noxious thermal sensitivity, as shown here by Hargreaves assay. In the pinprick, fMR1 knockout rats showed initial hypersensitivity to a noxious mechanical stimulus. However, there was no significant effect of genotype in the final testing session. In conclusion, we showed that baseline touch and pain sensitivity is largely unaltered in the fMR1 knockout rat model of Fragile X. However, evidence for noxious pinprick hypersensitivity is inconclusive. And if you'd like to learn more about this, you can visit my poster during the session. Thank you very much. So now we have um, a presentation by Rachel Wiley, and she'll be talking about introducing a new model of care management of patient waiting times in NHS GGC pain management service. Go ahead, Rachel. Thank you very much. Um, so prior to 2019, our service was trying to manage ever increasing wait times. And despite our best efforts to tackle this with waiting list initiative clinics, MDT triage, ACRT and the introduction of non-medical first contact appointments, the capacity and demand still didn't match. So you can see in September 2019, we introduced pain early information sessions for our patients. This was at point of entry to the service and before their first clinic appointment. And this allowed us to better manage expectations and tackle wait times. You can see from the graph that there was a dramatic reduction in numbers of patients waiting over 12 weeks um, over a six month period from October 2019 until the service was paused for obvious reasons. As the service resumed and was remobilised virtually in October 2020, you can see that the wait times were even higher. But as these sessions were introduced, they had even greater effect and wait times are now consistently down to 12 weeks. <coughs> We've been able to deliver an innovative service change which not only reduces wait times with more timely access to specialist pain service support, but more importantly, an enhanced patient experience which has proven to be adaptable and sustainable. Thank you very much. Um, so next we have Rachel Wiley um, from NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde speaking about what matters to you. Can early pain information sessions improve patient understanding, experience and engagement with pain management services? A comparison of face-to-face -face and virtual delivery methods. So following on from, from the last slide there, we, I guess we'd often heard from our patients that were accessing the service that they were unsure about what we offered within the service, why they'd perhaps been referred or that they were hopeful for medical management of their pain with very little awareness of the supported self-management approaches that we offer. So with the introduction of early information, we had the opportunity to better manage these expectations but also promote shared decision-making and work towards outcomes of care that best meet patients' needs. So we gathered patient feedback um, via questionnaires from both face-to-face -face and virtual sessions. So this was pre and post lockdown. And interestingly, we had similar themes that emerged from both, and you can see these from the quotes on the screens. Patients told us that they felt better prepared for what the service offered and that they could be signposted to the best person in a timely way. They also said they felt more confident about the approaches they were already using and that they could take further ownership for their well-being. They realised they weren't alone in their journey and they felt listened to and that what was important to them can be considered to help shape the care that they receive. So we've been able to demonstrate that the provision of early, low cost and high quality information enhances that patient experience and provides effective care. And that's regardless of the method of delivery. Great. Thank you, Rachel. Now, uh, Neil Clark was scheduled to give us a presentation on pain pilot project for the data uh, blitz, but unfortunately Neil wasn't able to get into our platform today, so we are now going to move forward to the next presenter. And 
Our next presenter will be uh, Mary, Mary Ellen Foster, and she's going to be telling us about using AI enhanced social robots to improve children's healthcare experiences. Hi. Yeah. Yeah, hi. So I am a senior lecturer in human robot act interaction in the School of Computing Science at the University of Glasgow. But I'm here today to talk about a collaborative project um, with some colleagues in Scotland and also some colleagues in Canada. And the, the motivation for this project is that children experience pain and distre distress in clinical settings every day. And there's already been uh, various projects that have been tested in this area to try using socially assistive robots um, to help children to cope with those situations. But in most cases, those robots have been completely teleoperated, essentially they're puppets, which limits the flexibility and adaptability of, the, of those robots to deliver these interventions. So in this project, what we're aiming to do is build um, an autonomous and responsive social robot designed for this situation, and then ultimately to evaluate it through a clinical trial um, through two Canadian pediatric emergency departments. And so the tasks in this project right now, we're working on some co-design with stakeholders in Canada. We're also, we've also begun technical development of the robot system. And, and hopefully, a, you know, the next year or two, we will actually run this clinical trial in Canada. And also an important thing we're thinking about on this project is the ethical and social implications about what role is appropriate to give a robot in this context with this vulnerable population. And more generally, what is the right way to use socially assisted robots in a pediatric healthcare sort of context? So if you want to find out more about this project, come talk to me at my poster. Excellent. So next up, we have um, Nicola Bailey, who will talk to us. She's also from NHS, but Highlands, um, about telephone pain management program. Hello. So my poster is about a physio-led six-session telephone primary care pain management program child in rural highlands in uh, sky Nicola, can, I, can i stop you there for a second sorry to interrupt you you're in a nice flow but um i think the audio might be a bit challenging i don't know if others are experiencing that just with your microphone let's see is that better yeah okay all right i'll give you give you a fresh start in time go ahead okay so we got funding from the mpp government to fund and recruit a senior physio and admin staff part-time to support the delivery and design of this pain management programme. It's a brand new service in Highlands and ident we're identified in rural areas, particularly in Sky, we had an increased referral rate from secondary care into secondary care. This was allowing for um, poorer access to our services and patients that live in Sky have to travel huge distances to come to the the pain management program there's long waits so this pain management program uh, allowed direct access to to this kind of service delayed and um, stop patients having to travel and um, so what did we actually do we did some training with gps on the referral criteria and we recruited 41 patients to a six session pain management program that was delivered by the physio that was recruited they did six sessions individually tailored and we did outcome measures before and after the session for four domains um, of the patients that did respond, 57% of them improved in terms of their mood, quality of life, function and medication use, and 68% of those that responded also found that the course was outstanding. It allowed the patient direct access, so they did only have to wait up to two weeks for pain mushroom skills. It then um, helped GPs be able to apply um, less biomedical approaches to pain management. We're hoping to get further results from GP consultation time and how GP consultation time might have changed over a six month period and medication use. And in the future, we're hoping to replicate this out across the whole NHS island using AHPs. And if you need to know any more about um, the project, you can come to the poster. Sorry if you couldn't hear me. Thanks, Nicola. If, if I were you, I would uh, dispense with the headphones and try and get your audio to work on your computer before the next poster session, because it's very hard to hear you, but I think we got the gist of it. So well done. Thank you very much. Okay. Now we're going to move on to a presentation by uh, Phil Sizer. Um, and uh, the, 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 the title is um, Outcomes from People Suffering from Chronic Pain Who Have Had Access to Supported Self-Management During the COVID-19 Pandemic. Go ahead, Phil. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everybody. I'm actually doing this on behalf of a colleague, Sonia Cotton, who's unable to be here today. Um, but um, so it's quite interesting because I've delivered a lot of this project myself. 
So the essence of this is that when COVID kicked in, um, we had um, a service that was all delivered in person in groups throughout the country, um, or if you like, standing in front of a flip chart. And we had to make an overnight change to doing all of our groups and courses online immediately. And uh, so that was the big cliff that we fell off. Um, the bottom line with all of this work is it worked. Um, we'd, we, we'd never been uh, had to do this. Um, and um, online work always seemed to be a foreign country. But actually, it worked remarkably well. And a lot of people, um, as a result of this survey, said that they felt that they were supported during COVID. 62% um, said they had a reduction in GP visits. 87% um, said that sessions were helpful online during COVID. 96% um, said they coped better as a result. Um, so generally, the bottom line is the, the green box which is we've learned a lot from this and we've been told that um, people would prefer a blended service going forward. So we mix face-to-face -face and online work. So it's a really interesting time in terms of... So sorry, Phil. That's all right. I was going on too much. <laughs> but I think what your your timing shows is that you're passionate about the project and 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 the service and uh, the the self management, you know, sh the shift. So um, go to his poster session and, and hear more about it. I think that's that's right. right. Okay. So next up is um, Pat Roche. Now, Pat, can we see if you're having uh, we're able to hear you at this moment? Yes, I'd love you to hear me. Can you hear me? We can. Oh, right, yeah. right. I can't see my slide up. Okay. Um, oh, do you re remember uh, what you were going to speak to about it? Okay. Can If you could do the title for me, then... I, I will know. definitely. Absolutely. Okay. So Patricia Roach is coming to us um, and speaking to us about patients' experience of using TENS at home for intermittent claudication pain. Thank you. Good afternoon. Our previous studies led by Chris Sinan, identified that high frequency TENS applied to the calves of patients with peripheral arterial disease, or PAD, help patients, first of all, to self-manage their recommended daily exercise, secondly, to modify the pain of intermittent claudication, or IC, in their calves when walking, and thirdly, to walk further. The next logical step was to train six participants from those studies to apply TENS daily for one month when exercising and then to obtain their feedback via a focus group study. Our results, broadly speaking, were that living with PAD and IC is characterised as a life full of frustration, including frustration at health professionals' attitudes, and that using TENS, despite masking IC pain, boosting motivation and walking performance, also brought frustra frustrations to some. The topics discussed, the quotes and the recommendations we make to clinicians prescribing TENS are shown in our full poster. Thank you. Excellent. We'll have a bit of a conflict introducing this because uh, Clara was working in my lab when she did this, but it's a pleasure to introduce Clara Dietler, who will be talking about establishing relative efficacies of analgesic muocode receptor agonists in a denylyl cyclase activity and beta restin 2 recruitment assays. And good luck doing that in 90 seconds. Thank you. Yours, Clara. Opiates remain one of the most effective classes of analgesics for treating moderate and severe acute pain. However, with the use of opioids, Detrimental side effects appear, which have been linked to beta restin 2 recruitment, but not to G protein signaling. This has led to the search for opiates biased against beta restin 2 recruitment. However, this may prove to be a challenging search. Our data suggests that agonists designated as biased against beta restin 2 recruitment are in fact partial agonists. This may implicate that partial efficacy is likely to account for a favorable therapeutic profile in baby that we look for in opioid analgesic. And I'm happy to talk more about this in my post session. Thank you. Thank you very much. 
Um, and our final slide today um, uh, for, for a poster teaser is um, Cass McGregor. Um, she will talk about a reflexive account of using an advisory group to develop a collected definition of acceptance of chronic pain. On you go, Cass. Thank you. So what is acceptance of chronic pain? As anybody was at my earlier um, talk, you can tell this occupies a lot of my time on the PhD. So you might wish to think about this now. What is it and how do you know this? So the next study in my PhD is a meta-ethnography and the research question is what is the lived experience of acceptance of chronic pain? So because there wasn't an adequate definition, we felt, um, we used an advisory group to, um, to make our own. So this was a group of advisors with lived experience, clinical and academic experience. And as it turned out, some of the roles were blurred. So you're looking at an iceberg um, because this gets, I guess, I suppose you can tell I'm coming at the perspective that this um, concept is socially constructed. Um, and I'm looking at the research from that perspective. So it gets to the idea there's a visible definition on top and all the murky ways that knowledge is created below this. So in the poster, there's an outline of the method and I've also chosen to show how the advisors approach this process by showing the reflexive statements. Excellent. Well, I think um, Catherine will agree that you all did very well that last slide didn't get the applause. I oh, know. No. Sorry. Here you go. I don't know how that happened. But... Right. Thank you. you go. Um, yeah, that's a that's a glitch. We need to fix that for next year. Um, yeah, I think Catherine and I both agree. I hope so, Catherine. That they did yes, a great definitely. job. Absolutely. And um, the next session will be um, for us to go to any of the posters that we like the sound of from the data blitz. So I'd encourage you to vote with your mouse clicker. And um, and then obviously after that, we'll have another um, oral presentation session. So thanks very much for joining us here and we look forward to seeing your posters. Thanks very much. Bye, thank you for joining Bye. us.